Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. We will get started here in just a few more minutes. Just a few more minutes and we will get started. Thanks so much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Will Tapia, and I'm the Advancement Coordinator for Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Central New Mexico. And I am here to welcome you to the uh, conclusion of our second week of our virtual Discovery Festival in 2020. Again, I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you for joining us on a Friday. Uh, so I'm going to just briefly speak about what Discovery Festival has looked like in the past and what it looks like this year in this current pandemic. So in the past, Discovery Festival is a one-day event held at the Albuquerque Convention Center, the last, uh, it's usually the last Friday before Thanksgiving, and we get about 3,000 students, which is amazing, all from central New Mexico, and uh, about 50 exhibitors who all do different exhibits based off of various areas of STEAM, and STEAM, of course, as we all know, is science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. So uh, this is a really super fun event for all of our students. Our teachers even get a big kick out of it. But obviously, because of the current pandemic situation that we all find ourselves in, an event like this just isn't possible this year. So we've taken that whole idea. We met with our teachers and said, hey, how can we make sure that this keeps going for this year? And overwhelmingly, the teachers were like, you know what? Let's do live webinar style uh, streams for our students. So that's what brings us to what we're doing for the entire month of November. <laughs> that's right. We started the first Monday of November and are going all the way until the last Tuesday before Thanksgiving. So it's a huge marathon of an event, but we're just so happy again to do this for all of our students. So we are hosting this series of webinars and open it up to the entire state, not just kids and students who can drive to the convention center. So this is exciting. So this year, we are so happy to announce that we are nearing 5,000 student registrations for 2020. So we're blown away by the response that we've received. Also today, this is a really important announcement for all you students who are watching. This today is the official closing at 3 p.m. today of our virtual STEM Fair and Art Expo. So you can find out more information about that by visiting our website, discoveryfestnm.org. You can click on the uh, virtual STEM Fair and Art Expo there at the top and it'll have all the information. Don't forget every student who registers, or every student who submits a project for the Art Expo and STEM Fair becomes eligible. They enter into a raffle to receive the new Xbox Series S. That's pretty exciting. I wish I could enter it. So um, anyway, so that's what we're looking like this year into 2020. So we still have about a week and a half left of presentations. So be sure to stick around. Uh, you can also on that same website, discoveryfestnm.org, you can see our schedule of events and all the different um, presenters who are coming up for this next week and a half. Um, and what I want to do as well, if I can get the screen up here, I want to just real quick give a shout out to some of our amazing um, our amazing sponsors for this event. What you're seeing now uh, would truly not be possible without the support of these folks. Um, Honeywell, uh, Honeywell is our Pre Da Vinci presenting sponsor this year. And um, they're just fantastic people. They're coming on at 2 p.m. today. So 
Uh, if you want to check out Honeywell's presentation, they're going to be speaking about magnetics. It's going to be really, really, really fun. They're coming on at 2 p.m. today on the same live stream, so you can go back to the, our YouTube page and view it. Or, of course, again, that website, discoveryfestnm.org, and uh, you can find there the link, the direct link to their YouTube webinar um, this afternoon. So we're happy to welcome Honeywell onto the stream for Discovery Festival. To our uh, Curie sponsor, Fidelity Investments. Uh, Fidelity uh, presented yesterday. They're always fantastic. They're always such a huge hit at, at, uh, at Discovery Festival. Um, they're just really, truly fantastic people. So uh, thank you so much, Fidelity, for your sponsorship, your support this year. To our ride sponsors, Aztec Machine Repair out in beautiful Bloomfield, New Mexico, and to Air Force Research Laboratories, AFRL. They're coming on uh, on Tuesday of next week, the 17th, and they're doing this really cool demonstration on satellites. So you're going to not want to miss that. It should be an absolute blast. Blast. Um, to our Newton sponsors, Defense Threat Reduction Agency, or as we like to call them, DITRA. Uh, they're also coming on next week uh, to Micronet Solutions, Sandia National Laboratories, and Presbyterian Hospitals. Thank you so much to all of our wonderful Newton sponsors. I think that's all of my announcements. Oh, I wanted to mention two, two things about the, the live stream that you're watching right now. So if anything crazy happens, I don't think it will. <laughs> I hope not, fingers crossed, but it is technology. And we all know sometimes technology just has some crazy things that happen and come up, right? So if anything crazy happens, if the stream goes down for whatever reason, if there's an interruption, just go right back to this YouTube page, BBBS CNM, okay? Big brothers, big sisters of central New Mexico, right back to that YouTube page. And we will have the live stream up and running shortly. If anything crazy happens, I don't think it will, but you never know. And then secondly, there's an awesome chat function on our YouTube channel, live chat. So if you type a question in there for the presenter, if you have a question, if you want a clarification, if you want to give us a shout out and tell us where you're watching from and what school, I'll read it live on air. We'll be a blast. We'll keep it hopefully engaging and dynamic for all of our amazing students who are watching from around the state of New Mexico. Even if you're a class, I know a lot of teachers broadcast these webinars inside of their Google Classroom. So if you are, please let us know where you're watching from. That'd be fantastic. Without further ado, I want to introduce uh, our first guest for this Friday, Mr. Philip Carmen. Philip, do we have you there? I'm here. Awesome. Philip, welcome to the live stream. Do you want to tell the kids uh, where you're broadcasting from? Sure. Uh, my name is Philip Carmen. I'm one of the associate deans for the School of Math, Science, and Engineering here at Central New Mexico Community College. And I'm actually here on campus. So I'm in a conference room here in, um, uh, at the main campus uh, at, of CNM. So that's why this is, this is not my home. I don't have a conference room <laughs> in my home. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, that's great, Philip. You know, I think the kids, as always, are really tired of hearing me blab in the beginning. So I'm going to turn it fully over to you. And like I said, students, if you have a question for Philip at any point during this presentation, type it in the chat and I will read them live on air. Philip, I'm going to leave it to you. All right. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen here. So uh, thank you for, before I share my screen, let me just um, thank you all for being here. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the programs and courses that we have available in the School of Math, Science and Engineering here at CNM. And I also have a lot of demonstrations to show you. A number of our faculty in the school have, uh, have recorded some science demos that I think you'll find really interesting. So let me share my screen here and I'm going to start with a very short presentation. All right, so math, science and engineering at CNM. So very quickly, we offer a number of programs in math, science and engineering. As you can see here, we offer biology, biotechnology, chemistry, dietary manager, earth and planetary science, which is also known as geology. And we offer associate degrees in all of these particular programs uh, with the exception of the dietary manager, which is a certificate. And then in addition to these programs, we also uh, have degree programs, associate degree programs in engineering, geography, mathematical sciences, nutrition, physics, and pre-health sciences. So we offer courses, of course, in all of these fields. 
And the, you have to remember that CNM is a two-year institution. So we offer, you know, it's a community college. So we offer freshman and sophomore level classes in all of these different disciplines. The beauty is that all of our courses in, or the vast majority of the courses in math, science, and engineering will transfer to the four-year schools in New Mexico and also most four-year schools across the nation. The whole idea of a community college and especially the way we've designed our programs in math, science, and engineering is such that you can basically complete your first two years of college here at CNM and then you could transfer to a four-year college and complete your bachelor's degree. So for example, if you were interested in engineering, you could get an associate of science degree in engineering here at CNM, and then you could transfer to another college and you would have, um, you would have basically your first two years of your college work done. And then you would enter your four-year institution as a, uh, as a junior and finish up your bachelor's degree there. And another advantage of CNM is uh, the fact that we have very low tuition, much lower than uh, most other institutions in the state. And also we have very small class sizes compared to a lot of the, uh, the larger institutions. So, you know, a lot of big universities have class sizes that may have dozens, if not uh, more than a hundred students in a class, but our class sizes are typically at the most uh, between 30 and 50 students. Uh, 50 is the, the largest that we have. So we have smaller class sizes, which a lot of students prefer because you can develop a closer relationship with your instructors and get more personalized instruction. And also you're probably aware that we have lots of uh, campuses. We have main campus at uh, CNM, but we also have a campus in Rio Rancho. Uh, we have the West Side campus, the Montoya campus, which is near the, the Sandias, uh, the eastern part of, of Albuquerque, and also the South Valley campus. And in addition to these programs in math, science, and engineering, we also offer courses in astronomy and natural science. We don't have degrees in those particular disciplines, but we do offer some astronomy courses and natural science courses. And uh, actually, uh, when I, I, I've been here at CNM for almost 23 years, uh, I started here as a physics and astronomy instructor, and I did that for 13 and a half years before I moved into administration, uh, into my current role as Associate Dean of Math, Science, and Engineering. So with that, uh, let me, let me just ask, at this point, even though I haven't uh, uh, shown you any demos yet, does anybody have any questions at this point in the presentation? Um, hey, Philip. So a quick question that I'm seeing coming in is asking about um, beginning a biology program at CNM. Would that be something under the, the natural sciences degree that you were, or the, the natural sciences coursework that you were speaking about earlier? No, actually the biology program is separate. So we do offer an associate's degree in, bio, in biology. The natural sciences uh, courses that we offer are really designed for students who are going into elementary school teaching. So the natural science courses um, are very basic and broad courses in the natural sciences, the physical sciences and life sciences. And they're designed um, for, and they also incorporate some uh, teaching pedagogy uh, uh, because part of the course is how to teach science to elementary school students. So those natural science courses are really geared towards students who are going into elementary school teaching. If you are interested in biology or field associated with biology, you would uh, go for the biology associate degree, uh, the associate of science degree in biology. Great, thank you so much. Sure. Any other questions? I'm not seeing anything else come in right now. All right then, so what I'm going to do without further ado is I'm going to I'm going to show you some demonstrations here that some of our faculty have have uh, recorded. So 
Let's start with this one. Good morning. Thanks for watching. My name is Dr. Jose Amaral. I am a teacher at CNM. I teach chemistry. I got my PhD from the University of California Merced in physics. Physics is the fundamental study of energy. Get that but fundamental physics property down there and it's always about energy. But I want to get back to that later and just have a little fun. I'm going to show you how to make little cherry bombs. They are kind of look like caviar. They are a small membrane with cherry juice inside. You could swap this out. You could do this with tea and other things, of course. And this is a great addition if you wanted to, say, throw these cherry bombs in a smoothie, a uh, strawberry smoothie. That way you're drinking the smoothie and then you get those nice little bites or little cherry bursts in your mouth, uh, cake. I mean, people use it for a lot of things. So uh, how does it work? Well, first thing I'm going to use is sodium alginate. Let's see if I can show you that there. You can buy it from a spice store. Okay, I'm going to take sodium alginate and I'm going to mix that with cherry juice. Common trick to thicken something like cherry juice. That's thickened cherry juice after I mixed it. it. Takes a few minutes to mix it. What is sodium alginate? Well, first it has sodium. You may recognize that from table salt. And also alginate. That word should even sound familiar. It's in seaweed. And this particular molecule likes to form a gel in the presence of salt water. That's why seaweed kind of feels gel-like. How does it get that texture? Where does that come from? It comes from its fundamental phys physical properties, okay? And that is that it turns into a gel in the presence of salt water. Isn't that weird? Not everything does, okay? So the next thing I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to mix calcium salt. It's kind of like table salt, but a little bit tougher. It um, just looks like white powder, of course. It, if you um, mix it with water, it just looks like salt water. Okay? But it, uh, the calcium adds an element. And, and here's why. This alginate needs some type of what we call an ion to form a gel. It doesn't always form a gel. Alginate won't always be a gel. In fact, as you can see here, alginate is clearly a powder, just like talcum powder or something like that. Okay, and so in the right conditions, the sodium alginate will form a gel because of the presence of salt water. Specifically, it's going to be the calcium ions that do it. What is an ion? Well, calcium is an element, as an element, hopefully you've heard today, um, can have a charge, a positive or negative charge. And when it does, in solution, we call that an ion. Okay, but back to fun stuff. Inside it's going to be cherry juice. We're going to have this membrane caused, a very thin membrane, caused by the reaction or the interaction between the alginate and the salt water. And what we're going to do is make cherry bumps. Simple as that. You can do it at home. Okay, so... Welcome to a screencast on an introduction okay, so to this molecular is something geometry. You should see up close. Here, here's the salt water. Here's regular cherry juice. Molecules here's the mixed cherry juice with the alginate. And then, of course, Thanos, right? All right. Let's see what it looks like. The first thing I'm going to do is show you guys that I'm not messing with you. And then if I take normal cherry juice and drop it in the salt water, nothing will happen. Not surprisingly, like cherry juice and water, like dissolves like. And it just dissolves like you would expect. Now remember, this has calcium salt. The presence of the calcium ions will interact with the alginate in this, the cherry bomb, in a way that creates a sphere immediately. As soon as it hits the water, it creates a sphere. Little spheres that look like that when you take them out, right? Now, I do think one thing that's important when you do this is try to go for consistency. When you're making a meal, people like everything to be the same. Why does this happen? Well, remember I talked to you about the fundamental study of energy that's physics. As soon as that alginate hits the salt water, 
it becomes energetically favorable. It is happier in an energy state where it forms a sphere in a way like it's trying to get away from the water, almost like it's hydrophobic. That word means water hating. Some things are hydrophilic. Some things are hydrophobic. Hydrophilic means they like water. As soon as that droplet hits the water, the alginate doesn't like the salt water, forms a sphere. And then what happens next? Well, the alginate reacts with the, calci the calcium ions and forms a very thin membrane on the outside. This membrane gets formed on the outside, and then a chemical reaction takes place to solidify this little sphere so the water doesn't get in there, and you end up with just a nice little cherry bomb. Let's think about why. Does anybody wonder why these, why some of them are floating and some of them are not floating? Why is this one floating? Well, when using an eyedropper, which you can get from any Hobby Lobby or Hobby Store, if there's a lot of air bubbles in the end of the tip, the cherry bomb will have air in it, and it'll end up being less dense than water, and it'll float to the top. So what does that mean about all of these at the bottom? These are properly made, they lack any air inside, and they are more dense than the salt water. Things that are more dense sink to the bottom. Just like if I put a penny in here, you all know it would sink to the bottom. Now, I want to show you one thing because I really like this. First off, these taste amazing. Trust. Burst of cherry, delicious. They do grow a little bit. Nice and hard to pop. Yummy. Now, we're gonna. I'm gonna show you. We're gonna show you how I can make this look like seaweed. So if you put the dropper in there, notice how when you slide it around quickly and you start with the tip under the water, you end up with this thing that, oh, I don't know, looks like algae. It's gel. It's a gel. It's not really a solid. It's too close. Or too, yeah, just too close. It's not really a solid. Hold it up. Still tastes like cherry. Nobody wants to find that in their cake. Trust me on that. So there you have it. This looks like seaweed. It looks like algae. It feels like algae, but it tastes great. Just make sure that you get the... Oh, everybody you cook for will like it if everything's the same size and nothing that looks like that. It does feel like seaweed. It does feel like algae. So the last thing I wanted you guys to think about and try is tea. You can make brew tea. You will have to chill it because this interaction here is not favorable if it's hot. You will get lumps in this if the tea is hot in the cherry juice and alginate. Okay? So these are the cherry bombs we just made that you guys saw made. And like I said, I really like when they end up with that same size all around. And thanks for watching, everybody. Have a good day. Very cool. Oops, hold on. <laughs> oh dear. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. That was that was very cool. We did get some questions in on that. Uh, I know uh, on my end, I was like, man, it's kind of making me hungry. Those cherry bombs sound delicious. <laughs> uh, but we did get some questions in. Um, so uh, one of the questions was asking if the salt in the experiment changes the taste of the cherry bombs. I don't think it does because the the salt doesn't get inside. So uh, as I'm not a chemist, I'm a physicist, so I don't know all the chemistry. But but uh, the Jose in that video explained how the uh, whatever it was calcium whatever forms a, some kind of a barrier around the cherry juice so that the salt water can't get in. So it won't taste salty. Awesome. Yeah. And, um, and one question that was answered inside the video um, that came up was uh, asking uh, why some of the cherry bombs are floating. And, 
you know, if I remember from the video correctly, he's saying the little air bubbles get trapped inside of right. some of the um, the droppers, and so it causes them to float and make it, of course, less yeah. dense than water. You got um, it. Exactly. Very well said. <laughs> you've heard some science. <laughs> um, let's see. Two more questions that just now came in was, um, uh, what is the best way to do science at home? That's a good one. Wow. Um, I, uh, well, it, I mean, you can do science just by observing things around you. If you're interested in biology, you can go outside and look at plants and animals, bugs, whatever. If you're interested in astronomy, like I was when I was a child, uh, you can, ever since I was five years old, I was interested in astronomy. You can, uh, you can get a telescope and look at the moon and planets and stars, or if you, you, even a pair of binoculars, you can see a lot with a pair of binoculars if you go someplace where, where it's dark. You'd be amazed at what you can see with a pair of binoculars. So there are a lot of things you can do at home, and I'm sure uh, you could probably uh, just go to uh, YouTube and find all kinds of little science types of demonstrations that you can do at home, like, like the one that Jose was just demonstrating now. So I'd say those are all possible avenues for finding ways you can do science at home. Yeah. And that's, you know, I think that's a great point, what you just said, Philip, um, because I think a lot of people, even adults, think that, oh, you know, in order to do science, in order to do these kinds of things, I have to have an advanced degree or I have to have, um, you know, all this specialized equipment or be in a lab, right? But, but I mean, exactly as you're saying, right, these, all these things begin on a very, very, very micro scale, so to speak, right? Absolutely. And I, I'm just, it makes me think of our beautiful and wonderful Bosky that we have that's just teeming with wildlife and different plants and things like that. It's a great way that now, you know, that, um, that we can be outdoors and the weather hasn't turned too, uh, too right. cold, too quick. It would be a great way to, to get outside and kind of explore your own backyard, you know? Exactly. Um, another, so another question that a student would like to know is how did you get into physics? Uh, well, I got into physics because of my love for astronomy. So I was, as I said, I've been interested in astronomy since I was five years old. I wanted to be an astronaut and the whole nine yards. And um, as I got older and when I went to high school and I took physics, I realized that astronomy has a lot to do with physics. And then I found out very quickly that, that astronomy basically is a branch of physics. So when I went to college, since I was interested in astronomy, I uh, majored in astrophysics because almost everyone who gets a degree in astronomy also gets a degree in physics because they're so closely related. So I did not originally have the intention of going into physics, but because my interest was astronomy and astronomy is really just one branch of physics, that's the field I pursued. Amazing, yeah. And um, kind of on, on that same note, a student would like to know, um, uh, what do you like? What do you like about astronomy, and what is your favorite planet? <laughs> I have to say, well, aside from Earth being my favorite planet because we live here, and this <laughs> is the only planet that we know of right now that can support life as we know it. Um, my other favorite planet would be Mars uh, because ever since I was eight years old, I wanted to be the first man on Mars, and that's probably not going to happen. But anyway, um, Mars is just a fascinating place. Uh, but what was the first part of the question? What, what do I like about astronomy? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just, uh, it's, it's hard to describe. I just think it's uh, the, the size of the universe is just so, it's so overwhelming. The universe itself is so majestic and we occupy one little speck of dust in the universe, our little tiny planet is we are one planet going around one star and our sun is one of uh, about a hundred billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy alone. And there are more than a hundred billion galaxies in the universe. And so it just boggles my mind that the universe is so big and we know so little about the rest of it because we're, you know, our entire experience is confined to this one little planet. So it, it's, there are just endless possibilities uh, when studying the universe. Wow, that's, that really is amazing. <laughs> and um, so uh, 
<laughs> this is kind of a funny one, but uh, do you believe in aliens? <laughs> uh, you know, I think that it's very likely, considering how many stars and planets there are uh, in the universe, it's probably very likely that there is life elsewhere. I, and we don't have any evidence yet. That's the key thing is there's no evidence of life anywhere in the universe other than Earth right now. We don't have that information. Uh, but given our understanding of chemistry, physics, biology, it's very likely that life does exist of elsewhere in the universe. Um, and it's almost certain that primitive life uh, is much more common than complex life. And it is possible that primitive life may be widespread throughout the universe, uh, but intelligent beings you know, intelligent life may be very, very rare. We just don't know. Uh, but I think that given the size of the universe, how many habitable planets there are in the universe, um, that the chances are very good that there is life elsewhere. But right now, and, and intelligent life possibly, uh, but right now we just don't know because we don't have that information. It's, uh, it, you know, the universe is a big place and it's like looking for a needle in the haystack. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, another, we're getting a couple questions rolling here all simultaneously, so I'm trying to keep up. So um, where did you go to college and did you like it? Oh, okay. I uh, got my bachelor's degree in New York. I'm from New York. Uh, so I went to the State University of New York at Stony Brook, which is now called Stony Brook University. And I got my bachelor's degree in physics and astronomy there. And then I went to the Florida Institute of Technology, also known as Florida Tech, uh, to get my master's degree in space sciences. Yeah, amazing. And I, and I love college. College was uh, one of the greatest experiences of my life. I, I, best years of my life, just fantastic. Awesome. And, um, uh, you know, obviously, uh, yeah, you're not teaching astronomy anymore. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, one of the students would like to know if you still study astronomy. Yeah, I keep up with it. I uh, subscribe to Science News, which is a bi-weekly uh, science news magazine so I can keep up with what is going on in the field. And otherwise, I, I check out astronomy websites so that I have a good idea of the latest developments in astronomy simply because I'm interested in it. So even though I'm not teaching it anymore, I still like, I still like to be uh, aware of the latest developments in the field. Awesome. Okay. Students, keep using that chat. We love your questions. Thanks, Philip. Okay. So we ready for another video? I guess so. So let me show you, let me share my screen again. And I have another chemistry video for you here. All right, we're gonna uh, play a little bit with dry ice here. Dry ice is interesting stuff. It is solid carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide, solid. And it is, uh, here's a big chunk of it. Notice I'm wearing gloves. You don't want to handle this without gloves. Uh, it's negative 78 degrees Celsius. So 78 degrees below zero on the Celsius scale. That's the temperature of that material. And at that low, low temperature, your carbon dioxide exists as a solid material. And what dry ice does at normal pressures, atmospheric pressure, it goes from being a solid to being a gas, gaseous carbon dioxide. And it's never really a liquid in between, hence dry ice. It never really turns into a liquid at normal pressures. So our dry ice, that's called sublimation by the way, when you change over from being a solid to being a gas without ever being a liquid. So we're going to take a few chunks of the solid material. Pop them into this little beaker and they should start to sublime. Should be turning into the gas. And so that you can see that it's a gas, we'll pop this here balloon on top of the flask. And as that solid carbon dioxide turns into gaseous carbon dioxide, you see it inflates the balloon and the balloon will keep growing for a bit here during that sublimation process. So again, you're going from solid carbon dioxide to 
gaseous carbon dioxide, and you're never really a liquid. You don't see any puddles of liquid carbon dioxide, and that is dry ice. And carbon dioxide, just so you know, here's our little molecular model. The black in the middle is the carbon atom, and the orange atoms there are the oxygen atoms, carbon dioxide. And it sublimes. And it's really, really cold. Now, what I'm going to do next here, and take some more of this dry ice, and I'm going to put it in this aquarium here, where it will start to sublime. So as it sublimes, it should fill the lower part of this aquarium with gaseous carbon dioxide. You won't be able to see it. Carbon dioxide is quite invisible to the human eye. So let's uh, break this up a bit. Let's put some of this dry ice in here, and we'll start producing a nice little invisible layer of carbon dioxide gas in this aquarium. And to kind of help trap the carbon dioxide there, I'm going to put a sort of a lid on here, as I can do. So within a few minutes here, we should have a nice invisible ocean of carbon dioxide gas filling about half of this here aquarium. The interesting thing is, carbon dioxide gas is more dense than the air. One of the first things you learn in chemistry is less dense material floats on top of more dense material. So less dense will float on top of more dense. Since the CO2 is more dense, you'll have this dense layer of invisible carbon dioxide. You won't be able to see it. But lighter gases, like the air, will float on top of it. And you'll see what we can do with that in just a moment. Okay, what you can see here is our balloon has inflated quite a bit. Remember we had the chunks of dry ice down there? That dry ice sublimed, filled up the balloon. Here in our aquarium we've got a whole bunch of big chunks of dry ice. So there should be a nice layer of carbon dioxide gas right here, somewhere in here. You can't see it, but that tank is filled with mostly carbon dioxide. And we have somebody here who's going to blow some bubbles, some soap bubbles in, which will be filled with air. And as I mentioned to y'all, air is less dense than carbon dioxide, so the soap bubbles hopefully and there's your soap bubbles floating on that little layer of carbon dioxide gas. Let's see if we can get another one in there. And there's your soap bubbles floating away. Because, again, the air that the soap bubbles are filled with is less dense than the carbon dioxide. And there's your soap bubbles floating. So that's an example of density and one gas being more dense than another. Okay, so Will, do we have any other questions? We do. Uh, By the way, so, can you see uh, the thing, can you see the thing that says, uh, when the, my, that video was playing, can you see the thing that says off timer three minutes? No, no, okay. I, I, I believe I just saw the, um, the video yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, because I'm going to lose my connection here. Well, my TV is going to go off in three minutes because it just started doing this last night. I don't know why, but I can turn it right back on again and I'll come back. But okay. anyway, so if I disappear for a second, <laughs> it'll, it'll just be uh, uh, for two seconds. No problem, no problem. I, I, I can happily, uh, uh, as the students well know by now, I can babble for as long as I need to. So, <laughs> uh, But uh, yeah, so one question that did come in was, and you know, I, I'm not sure if, if you're equipped to answer this, but it is about the experiment. If, um, so if, the, uh, if air is less dense than, than carbon dioxide, why is it that the balloon inflates? 
Okay, that's because of the pressure as the, you know, when you first put the balloon uh, over the flask, what happens is that the, uh, the air pressure in that whole thing is the same as the outside air pressure. Mm. But once the, you know, the uh, dry ice starts to sublimate and turn into a gas, you have more and more gas collecting inside that flask. So the air pressure is increasing. And so because the air pressure is increasing, it's becoming greater than the air pressure of the, the air outside. It causes the, the, the gas has to go somewhere. So it goes into the balloon and starts filling the balloon with air. I see. Okay. Okay. That's great. That, yeah, that, that's super helpful. Um, and one question that came in is asking, uh, uh, how does the density of carbon dioxide affect global warming? No, I'm not really sure. I don't think it, I don't think the density of the carbon dioxide has much of an impact on global warming. It's really the, the physical properties of the carbon dioxide. I mean, the carbon dioxide is mixed throughout the atmosphere. And because it does have a high density, you're going to find more carbon dioxide in the lower levels of the atmosphere than the higher levels. But the bottom line is that carbon dioxide is, uh, I'm going to lose my power right now, but I'll come back in a second. So, okay. No problem. Well, while he's doing that, um, I want to give a quick shout out to all of our students who are watching from around New Mexico. I know we have some classrooms who are, again, broadcasting this video okay, I'm back. throughout their Google Classroom. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, and we have some classes who are broadcasting this video in their classroom. So welcome to everyone. And I'll toss it back to Philip to answer that question. Okay. Yeah, so the carbon dioxide will tend to uh, be more abundant in the lower atmosphere than the upper atmosphere. The, mo but the most important thing about carbon dioxide regarding uh, global warming is that carbon dioxide is transparent to visible light, but it's opaque to infrared radiation. So what happens is visible light from the sun shines down on the earth, it comes through the, the atmosphere and it hits the ground and the carbon dioxide is perfectly transparent to that visible light. So the visible light comes down, hits the ground. And you know what happens when you stand in the sun? You feel warm, right? The sunlight warms you up. And then your body, as it becomes warm, uh, and your body does this all the time anyway, your body emits infrared radiation uh, because the type of radiation an object emits depends on its temperature. So your body is emitting infrared radiation but the infrared radiation can't pass through the carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide absorbs infrared. So as the sunlight comes down and heats the ground, the ground is re-emitting that energy it absorbed from the sun, but it's re-emitting it as infrared radiation instead of visible light. And the carbon dioxide absorbs that infrared radiation and that makes the atmosphere heat up. And that's what leads to global warming. That's a very, very quick, simple description, but that's basically what's happening with global warming. I see. And that makes a lot of sense to us here living in New Mexico, I think, right? I know that in the heat of the summertime, like in July, for example, when we have these big temperature swings from during the day, it could be 95 and then it, and at night it could be 75. But if you ever go for a walk anywhere that has a lot of rocks or a lot of concrete, anything like that, you're going to feel that heat radiating off of the surface, oh, right? Yeah, for sure. This would, this would probably be a little kind of an example of the infrared radiation that, that Philip's right. speaking about. Yeah, the, a great example is the coils of your stove. So if you have an electric stove at home, when you if you put it on high, you'll notice that as the coils begin to heat up, like if you turn off the lights in the kitchen so it's dark, but the stove is on, at first you can't see the coils glowing, but you can feel the heat coming off the coils. What you're feeling is infrared. The infrared, when it hits your skin, you sense as heat. And as the coils continue to get hotter and hotter, they begin to glow because as they get hotter and hotter, they emit more and more visible light. And eventually they get so hot that they give off visible light. So the coils will glow a reddish orangish color. So that's a, that's a very quick lesson on uh, electromagnetic radiation and, uh, and uh, how objects emit radiation based on their temperature. Awesome. Yeah, I love it. And uh, so does, uh, how does carbon dioxide, let's see, how, how does the density of carbon dioxide affect photosynthesis or does it? I don't think it does. 
you know, there's carbon dioxide in the air all around us and the, you know, plants extract that carbon dioxide uh, to, uh, for respiration. And I'm not a biologist, so I, I can't remember from my high school days exactly how photosynthesis works. Uh, but the density of carbon dioxide, I don't think plays a big role in photosynthesis. Awesome. Okay. And um, this question, uh, okay. So what does carbon dioxide mean? And I think they're asking about, um, they must be asking about the elements of the carbon dioxide. Yeah. Carbon dioxide is a molecule that consists of carbon and oxygen. And it has one, as you saw in the video right there, the, the professor who showed in that video was Joe Eridan, one of our chemistry faculty here. And you can see he had a model of a carbon dioxide model. You have one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms. That's why it's called carbon dioxide. Di meaning two. Mm, so okay. one carbon atom, two oxygen atoms. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. Uh, that looks like all the questions that I've received in so far. Keep using, keep sending us um, your questions, kids. This is awesome. I'm going to pass okay. it back to you. All right. So I have a biology demonstration. It's about 15 minutes long, which is too long. So I'm going to fast forward through some of it so you can see the really cool part of that demonstration. So let me share my screen again. And Philip, if you want, um, we can run a little bit over. I think the kids are going to get a kick out of this. It's totally okay. up to you. If you want to fast forward it, you can. Um, but otherwise, um, just okay. an FYI, if anybody's watching, we might run a little bit over. Okay. Uh, so let's see here. Um, where was that? Uh, let's see here. I think it's, here it is. Okay. Let me, uh, let me just click here. I should have done that to begin with. Hello, my name is Caroline. I teach biology at CNM, and today I'd like to explore our hearts with you. To help me, Today I have Mr. Galen the dog here, who is an expert in dog hearts. He also knows a lot about human hearts too. So first of all, where is your heart? Do you guys know? I've heard that if you put your fingers right here under your chin, you could feel your heart beating. I feel something. Do you feel something? Hmm, I wonder if my heart is here in my neck. I've also heard if you put two fingers right here on your wrist, you can feel your heart here also. I can feel something wiggling. Do you feel anything? Do you think my heart is in my wrist? Oh, Mr. Galen says no. He says your heart's in your chest. I knew that. So if you make a fist, you put your fist right in the middle of your chest. That's where your heart is. Pretty cool. So your heart, how can, if it's in your chest, how can you feel it in your wrist and feel it in your neck? Do you know what your heart's job is? Your heart actually pumps blood to all the different places in your body. It pumps blood to your wrist and it pumps blood to your neck. And you can feel it pumping the blood through blood vessels right here. And that's what you're feeling there. Feeling your heart pumping blood. So cool. How would you guys like to take a look at a real live, not live, but a real heart? Mr. Galen has three hearts that he brought here today. We have those hearts here in this cooler. Before we take a look at them, we said we had three different hearts. So let's think about if we can tell the difference between those hearts when we look at them. So we have one heart that's from a pig. We have another heart that's from a cow. And our last heart is from a sheep. 
So I'm gonna pull these hearts out and I want you to think about, is this a pig heart, a cow heart, or a sheep heart? All right, I'm gonna put my gloves on. So these hearts, they came from a butcher, so they are a little bit bloody, but they're really cool. Got my gloves on. I'm gonna put my heart in here. Hopefully you guys can see this. Are you ready? All right, here's the first heart we're looking at today. Oh my gosh, it's big, it's so big. I'm having trouble lifting it. Big, heavy heart. What animal do you think has a heart this big? It's huge. Let's take a quick look at this heart here. I see, I see some red, some reddish colored stuff on here. Uh, that's our heart muscle. Do you know our heart is basically a giant muscle? See some white stuff here, there's some fat around this heart. If you look close, you see some lines. Do you guys see some lines around here on this heart? Those are all little teeny tiny blood vessels on the heart. And if something got stuck in one of those blood vessels, that could cause this animal to have a heart attack. All right, so we have this giant heart. Think about what kind of animal you think that heart belongs to. All right, and here's a, Here's a medium-sized heart. A lot smaller than that giant heart, huh? And let's take a look at this one. We have some of that same reddish muscle tissue. We have some white fat. We have these lines that are the blood vessels moving through this heart. Pretty cool. And we have one more heart in here. And this is our smallest heart. Let's take a look. Look at that, we still have some of that red muscle, white fat, and the lines of these little blood vessels. They all kind of look pretty similar, except one is huge. These two are a little bit smaller. I wonder if they look the same on the inside. Maybe on the inside we'll see some differences that help us decide if it, which one's the cow heart which one's the sheep heart, and which one's the pig heart. Let's take a look here. So inside this giant heart, let's see, what can we see? I see some stringy things here. There's some white strings. I see some flaps up here. I see some hollow spots. There's a kind of a hollow spot right here. There's a hollow spot right here. If this heart were were alive and pumping, this spot right to these spots here would be full of blood. I right, let's look at my next heart. Let's look at the medium one next. Let's see. All right, we've got some white stringy things here also. And we have some hollow spots. There's a hollow spot here. And there's a hollow spot here that can get filled up with blood. So cool. If we look at this one, this one has some extra stuff on the top that got chopped off of our giant heart. So let's take a look at that. Right here, look at that. There's a there's this tube sticking out of the top of my heart and another tube sticking out of the top of my heart. Whoa. Those are actually blood vessels that take blood out of the heart and send it somewhere else in the body. Pretty cool. Let's take a look at our tiny heart. Oh, do we see any differences? Well, we also have white stringy things. And we also have some hollow spots. There's a hollow spot here. And here, and then here's another hollow spot on that side. Hmm. So the insides, we all have hollow spots and we have these stringy things. And, and we have these tubes that are sticking out of the heart. They're kind of similar, really. So really the biggest difference that I see, so there's a big one, a medium one, and a little one. So which animal do you think is the biggest? I think you're right, I think it's the cow. Mr. Galen, is that right? He said, yes, the cow, this is the cow heart, this big giant one. 
So the middle one, the medium sized one, is this gonna be a pig or a sheep heart? Mr. Galen says, this is the pig heart. So the pig heart is actually a little bit bigger than the sheep heart that we have. And then this is our sheep heart from the smaller one. Wow, pretty cool. So do you think, since all these hearts have the same parts, do they all work the same way? Yes, Mr. Galen says yes. So let's take a look. So here in our sheep heart, so we said we were looking at some hollow regions here. So we actually have four hollow regions and we call them chambers in the heart. We have four different chambers. And each chamber fills up with blood and then pumps that blood somewhere else, squeezes the blood somewhere else. So first, the first chamber where the blood enters is gonna be, there's a little chamber right up in here. It's called an atrium. The blood's gonna fill up in this atrium and it's gonna go down here into this big, big chamber down on the bottom. It's called a ventricle. And it's gonna flow out of this ventricle. I'm gonna see if I can send my finger out where the blood would go. You see my finger on this side? That's where the blood leaves that ventricle. And it goes to the lungs. It, actually, it leaves the heart. It only goes through two chambers. It leaves the heart through this blood vessel, goes to the lungs. What? At the lungs, we can actually get a, fill our blood up with oxygen and then send it back to the heart. So we were just looking at this side of the heart. So it gets sent back to the heart to this other side, up in here. Then it's gonna go down into this chamber, down here. And then it's gonna leave the heart. And I'm gonna close this up so we can see how it leaves this chamber. It's gonna leave this chamber through this artery. And then it's gonna to go to the whole rest of your body, to your arms and your legs and the tips of your toes, all through that chamber, uh, through that artery. All right, so we've looked at three different hearts. So let me put these away. And I'm gonna take my gloves off and while we're doing this, I want you guys to think about how much blood actually moves through your heart and through your body. So I'll go ahead and take off my gloves. And I'm gonna go wash my hands. All right, now that we're all cleaned up, how much blood do you think the heart pumps through the body? Well, Mr. Galen has a bottle of blood here says this much blood. No, not this much. This much blood. Hold on, there's another one. This much blood. This is how much blood usually gets pumped through your body by your heart in one minute. That's a lot of blood. I wonder if we can do a measurement to see if your heart pumps this much blood or if it pumps a little bit less or a little bit more. Hmm, Mr. Galen says he has a, a stopwatch, so we can, we're gonna go ahead and do that. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna time how many, how many times your heart beats in six seconds. And we're gonna use that to calculate how much blood your heart is moving through your body in one minute. Okay, so I'm gonna start the timer when I say go. I want you guys to find, so first go ahead and find a point, a place where you can feel your heartbeat. So either on your under your chin or on your wrist, just go ahead and find that place. Can you feel it? All right, I feel mine. All right, when I say go, you're gonna start counting. Count how many heartbeats you have until I say stop. And then you're gonna stop counting and remember your number. Okay, ready, set, go.
stop. What number did you get? So keep that number in your head. We're going to do it one more time for the people who might have forgotten to count that time. Okay, so we're going to do it one more time. If you already have a number, remember what it is. If you don't have a number yet, this is your chance to get that number. All right, ready, set, go. Stop. Are right, you got your number in your head? So think about that number. Now think about your, that number and think about sticking a zero onto the other side of that number. So if your number was seven and you stick a zero onto it, it turns into 7D. Or if your number was six and you put a zero on it, it turns into 6D. Okay, so think about your new number with that zero attached to it. All right, so if your number, if your number is 7D, 7D, this is how much blood your heart is pumping in one minute right now. If your number was less than 70, so if your number was 60 or 50, then your heart was pumping a little bit less blood than, than this. Maybe, maybe half this plus half of this. If your number was bigger than 70, your heart was pumping even more blood than this in one minute. Wow, so now you know how much blood your heart can pump. Pretty cool. And if you think about it, your heart is pumping this much blood or a little bit more or a little bit less every day, even when you're asleep for your whole life. That's a lot of work that your heart's doing. So I hope you guys learned something about the heart today. And I hope you agree with me that biology is pretty cool. See you next time. All right. I know the sound was a little bit hard to hear on that last one, but I, I trust people could hear. Yeah, it was it was coming great on my end. Um, and I have to say, I am I am pretty squeamish myself, so I had to back away from that video a little bit. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I think it was uh, everything was coming through great on my end, Philip. Well, I just wanted to be sure that, you know, if we have anybody out there who's interested in biology, I wanted to make sure they got to see a biology demonstration. So that was... Uh, I, yeah. mean, I thought it was pretty cool looking at, at those three different uh, types of the three different hearts, but you can see that they all basically function the same way. Uh, they have slight differences, but they all serve the same purpose. Mm -hmm. And um, a question that came in is asking if um, uh, in the CNM biology department, if, the, if they'll be able to dissect hearts as well. I don't know if they dissect hearts in the in biology. I know they do dissections, uh, but I don't know exactly what uh, animals or or organs they dissect. I would imagine because the heart is such an important organ, I would imagine that um, in some of the biology classes they actually do have a uh, at least one lab where they dissect a heart. To, uh, to look at the structure of the heart. Awesome. And uh, why, why are dissections important? Well, dissections are important because they help us understand the, uh, the way an organ is put together and that helps us understand its purpose and how it functions. So as Caroline, uh, who's one of our biology faculty members, as she was explaining, you could see inside the heart, the different chambers, and you could see the tubes coming out. So you can see where the blood comes into the heart and it gets pumped by, you know, the heart is a big muscle. So it's pumping, you know, squeezing the blood and pumping it throughout the body. So you can see from those, the structure of the heart, how the blood comes in and then it goes out through one of the tubes that goes to the lungs so that oxygen can get in the blood then it has to go back to the heart into a different chamber where, where that blood that now has all that oxygen in it is then shot out to other parts of the body so that all the cells in your body get the oxygen that they need to survive. So the importance of the dissection is to be able to look inside the organ and figure out how it works and 
what it's doing to help keep us alive, whether it's your stomach or your heart or whatever. Yeah. Every organ in your body is doing something to help you keep you alive. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's, it's a great point too. You know, it's, uh, and I'm sure a lot of our students learn this way as well, but how do we learn how a radio works? You know, some of my best memories as a kid were taking apart the family radio, you know, and, uh, and that sort of thing. And this is, this is the same thing, but you know, as you're saying with the heart. So I think it's, I think it's pretty cool if you're not squeamish like me. So, <laughs> um, and, uh, so a question is asking, um, uh, why do the hearts have fat on them? You know, I'm not really sure. I think all of your internal organs have some amount of fat. Um, I think the fat that is inside your uh, your chest cavity, you know, and that's that surrounds any of your organs is called, I believe it's called visceral fat. Um, again, I'm not a biologist, so I'm just going by what biology I remember. Uh, but all of your internal organs have a little bit of of fat around them. I don't know the purpose of, the, of that fat, if it serves any purpose, uh, but I do know that most of your internal organs do have some fat around them, um, some visceral fat. Awesome. Okay. Sorry we don't have any biologists here <laughs> live. <laughs> <laughs> nope, no problem. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, so two other questions just now coming in are asking, um, uh, this is a tough one. <laughs> um, is there a chemical or is there, I, I would imagine, what is the chemical composition of blood? Oh boy. That's a tough one. <laughs> I, bet, I, I bet a biologist could answer that, maybe even a chemist, but I'm, I'm just not sure. Um, you know, you, you have white blood cells and, and red blood cells, which serve different purposes. Uh, red blood cells I know have iron for sure, because mm-hmm. iron helps to carry, to absorb the oxygen from the lungs and carries that oxygen throughout the body uh, in the red blood cells. Uh, But uh, what the actual fluid is made of, blood plasma, I'm not really sure. So Mm -hmm. I'm I'm sorry, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Well, and this is a good thing for the students too, you know, while you're at home, while you're on your, your Chromebook or whatever it is that your school district has given you, this would be a great thing to Google and look up and, and do a little bit of digging. Um, you know, I know another question came in asking about how does the heart pump and, uh, another, another great Google question, you know, I, yeah, well, I believe it's with electricity, right? Yeah. Well, it, it can, it, it pumps, it contracts like any other muscle and you just have to remember in your body, you have, Uh, There are two different types of muscle. You have voluntary muscle and involuntary muscle. So for example, your your biceps is is a voluntary muscle because I can relax it when I want to, but I can also contract it when I want to, when I want to flex that muscle. But then you have other muscles that that, uh, contract involuntarily. They do so automatically. So like your heart muscle, it has to keep pumping all the time. You, you know, if you had to think about contracting your heart to keep your blood flowing, if you got distracted and you forgot, <laughs> your blood would stop flowing. So the heart keeps going even when you're sleeping, even when you're thinking about something else. So that's something that's automatic. And as Will said, you know, it, it's uh, driven by electrical signals. There are electrical signals. And, and, you know, I don't know the details again, but you're through your uh, nervous system that makes sure that your heart beats regularly to meet the needs of your body. You know, when you exercise and your body needs more oxygen, you know, you're, you're breathing heavily and whatnot, then your heart beats faster. And when you're resting or sleeping, your heart beats more slowly because you don't need as much oxygen. You don't need as much energy. And luckily, we don't have to think about that because our our bodies do it automatically. So uh, your body is pretty darn smart. It has all that figured out without you even having to think about it. Awesome, I love it. Uh, it looks like those are all the questions we got in for now. All right. Well, um, is it, um, I guess that we're finished. Awesome, yeah, okay, that sounds, that sounds great. Those, um, those videos are really, really, really amazing. And what we're gonna make sure to do as well on our end is uh, send those out to all the students. And don't forget, uh, students and teachers, that YouTube link that you clicked to get here 
once we're done with the live stream, that link will still be available. So you can rewatch these videos, you can share with your classes. I know different uh, science teachers are looking for ways to uh, engage their classes with different experiments now that we're all at home. So I think this would really be an awesome resource. So please come back to it, reference this video. And I think you'll uh, you'll get a big kick out of some of the awesome experiments. So thank right. you so well, much, well, Philip, for being sure. on today. Well, thank you again all for being here. Well, thank you, Will, for moderating and then making sure everything ran smoothly. And uh, thanks to everyone who attended. I hope that you you enjoyed it. it sounds from from the questions, sounds like uh, you all enjoyed the demonstrations. And if you have any other questions, uh, you can certainly uh, contact CNM if you're interested in coming here to uh, to pursue a, a degree, or even if you just want to take a few classes here, uh, get your toes wet and see what we have to offer. We have uh, lots to offer here at CNM. So. Um, glad you could be with us and thank you all and have a great weekend. Thank you so much, Philip. You have a good one. All right. Take care. Take care. And uh, finally, uh, just another <clears throat> sponsor shout out um, as we wrap up uh, this first Friday presentation. Thanks to all of our sponsors, Honeywell, Fidelity Investments, Aztec Machine and Repair, uh, AFRL, Air Force Research Laboratories, and all the other sponsors you see there on the bottom left hand of your screen. Don't forget, don't forget, that uh, we have Honeywell coming on today at 2 p.m. Right back here, you can of course find that uh, live stream link in your, uh, uh, on our website, discoveryfestnm.org and your teachers all have that link as well. So be sure to check out Honeywell's presentation this afternoon. Um, I think that's everything. <laughs> I always feel like I'm forgetting something when I do these, but um, anyway, you all stay, ha stay healthy, stay happy, stay safe, and we'll see you at 2 p.m. Take care.